Hello, um, welcome back to um, module 2 of uh, our lecture series on cultural studies. Um, we have already done uh, part 1 of uh, the uh, one of the key concepts that we are dealing with in this course, um, namely ideology and uh, we just have uh, we just began to we have just began to unpack okay, the various contours and nuances of the term ideology. We are now um, uh, in part 2 of uh, uh, you know the, uh, the lecture on, uh, on ideology. As you are aware these um, uh, lectures are being recorded um, mainly for the students of um, uh, engineering colleges all over uh, our country and those who have those who are interested um, from uh, from abroad and uh, it is not really um, though it is targeted uh, you know the target main target is uh, engineering students. Uh, my uh, hope is that students in the humanities who of course know uh, you know so many of these topics would find it uh, find these lectures useful uh, if only to recapitulate on what they have learned earlier. Um, it is uh, the NPTEL or the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning, a joint venture by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, uh, that have uh, that are bringing to you these lecture series. So um, we, as always, we will now do a recap of what we have learned so far, um, as far as the last module is concerned. Quickly. We saw that we have moved, uh, you know, uh, at least, well, it is in the beginning of the course, really, that we had moved into the new cultural studies. It left behind the uh, basically and largely anthropological uh, focus on culture as a way of life. And we um, ca should remind ourselves once again that we are looking at culture as uh, meaning making, okay, what Clifford Gates had so um, aptly termed you know the webs of significance or the webs of creation or the networks okay, of meaning and value that we ascribe to different cultural phenomena. Uh, we also saw uh, that Chris Barker had at one time uh, even said that the concept of ideology is so very seminal, so, so important okay, uh, and so as he says influential in cultural studies that at, at one time the, the you know the field of cultural studies was dubbed ideological studies. Then we uh, saw um, different uh, or a variety of definitions of the term ideology and you will recall that ideology we see we saw ideology as a set of ideas as consciousness and what was the term received consciousness if you remember uh, and as a world view as uh, something that may go on to be uh, a doctrine or a set of rules to be strictly followed and as I said m importantly it is uh, ideology is all is seen um, as you know maps of meaning okay something that uh, you know carries you or points you towards meaning creation then we also uh, looked at the you know at how ideology uh, uh, how we end up consuming ideology we have to remember that before consumption of these views ideas values and meanings okay uh, these have to come through uh, come to us and how do they come to us they come to us through a certain institutionalized processes that have to do with the production of such meaning uh, values and ideas in the first place. Then there has to be a system of distributing them. For instance, I said mass media could very well be one, uh, you know, um, a one way of uh, getting ideology to people. And um, uh, in, in th those senses, ideology is uh, of course manufactured and our consumption, uh, you know, um, uh, our consumption of ideology or ideological artifacts or you know ideas thoughts etcetera are therefore um, given to us through institutionalized processes. Herein uh, a second uh, a second point comes to mind which I have to mention is that in the whole process of consuming ideology okay, we would do well to remember what goes into the 
manufacture of such things, okay, into the manufacture of um, uh, in the manufacture and production and distribution of ideology. Now, um, I will take you back, if you recall, uh, to my uh, to my lectures, two lectures on Marxism that I had given, and uh, uh, many of you would remember this very important sentence from Marx, and I quote: "The ruling ideas of each age." have ever been the ideas of its ruling class. Uh, we cannot overstate this in the sense that the, you, know, the, you know this is so seminal that uh, it can never be uh, an exaggeration. Okay? This I have brought this uh, quotation from Marx back from those lectures to you here again why? Because this relates to just to what we have just spoken about okay, is the manufacturing of ideology. Okay. So, uh, a very obvious question that comes to our mind is okay, ideology is produced, it is distributed and before it is eventually consumed by us, is not it an important question to ask who creates it, okay, who produces ideology and Marx has a clear answer to this. He says that the ruling ideas. Now, just supplant this with the word with the term ideology and you will understand how it ties in, how it is so seminal to our understanding of ideology. The ruling ideas or the ideologies right, of each age has uh, have ever been the ideologies of its ruling class. Now, you will recall that class is the most important, perhaps the most important uh, uh, the term in uh, you know um, in uh, in Marxism, um, Marx saw each you know epoch being informed by you know the uh, uh, you know by the conflict between two large classes. Okay, whether it was in in ancient slavery, the conflict between uh, the uh, the masters and the slaves whether it was in feudalism, uh, you know the uh, class conf conflict between two classes that of the feudal overlords and the serfs or the vassals. Okay. Uh, then uh, we saw in capitalism, we saw uh, the two classes of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Okay. So, there according to the Marxist schema, all each and every epoch okay, is characterized by class conflict. And in this case, the ruling ideas of each age have ever been the ideas of its ruling class would mean that these two major classes in every age, okay, it was the privileged uh, class, it was the class that had power of governance, of wealth, you know, of economics. Um, uh, uh, it, it was that class that defined the ruling ideas was that class that defined the ideology, it was that class that produced and then distributed the central ideas or you can say the central doctrines that were to be followed by everyone. Okay. So, this is where the political, this is where issues of power come in between. So, we have to remember that whenever we consume an ideology, we have to also ask very importantly ask who has produced it, by what means has this ideology been disseminated to us, how much of it do I consume, how much of it do I critique, how much of it do I discard. Okay? So, Marx of course, is central uh, in, an, in any, in any um, uh, discussion of, of ideology. Okay? Look at it in a different way in this slide. Ideology is or affects through a dominant class. Ideology is something that affects matter and mind. Now, what does this mean to say that ideology, uh, uh, you know, is a, uh, affects both matter and mind, or that to, to say it in another way, ideology is both material and mental. Okay. Of the of matter and of mind, and that it is it comes through us through through the filter of a class, which in a certain 
period of time is the dominant class. Okay? It means that um, the uh, is, is matter or the, the economic base. Remember, we had uh, looked at the two terms base and superstructure, and we found that it is the economic base comprising what? Compris recall comprising the forces of production and the relations of production, in a word, the modes of production okay, that determine the superstructure that rises above it. There is this architectural metaphor here, as we all know, okay, based on our material reality, based on economics, based on the way the way, you know way wealth is distributed, labor is distributed, demarcated, divided, okay, on that arises a superstructure. I would hasten to remind you once again um, uh, that this determination is in no way a deterministic one. Okay. The point here is there is a relation between um, the material base. So, there is a relation I say between the matter, okay, the matter that gives rise to the mind, the matter that gives rise to the to the superstructure. Now, the superstructure, sorry, the superstructure is where we would we would eventually place ideology. Okay. Uh, superstructure comprises what? Superstructure comprises all these institutions that we have, the family, the legal system, the judicial system, the mass media, the educational system, okay? any, any institution of society whether tangible or intangible fall under the superstructure. Okay? And if you, you, may, uh, you may well uh, put all of these into one term you can put them into one term and that term we would call ideology. Okay? And hence, ideology filtered through a class is, a, is both a material and a mental matter, so to speak. Okay? Then we saw, uh, we ended with political ideologies and um, we talked about just a few and I said there are so many really. Uh, we talked about liberalism and remember what, what, what was our important point there? Our point was political ideologies have as their goal the organization, okay? the organization of society in a way in which each of these ideologies feel okay, is conducive uh, or is the ideal way in which people should be governed, in which people should be arranged, their lives should be arranged in society or in a culture. So, given that we found that some of the you know some of the uh, uh, ideologies, political ideologies may be liberalism, the ideology called capitalism, communism, environmentalism, feminism, anarchism etcetera. Okay? So, these are the political ideologies. Now, we will move on to the rest of uh, rest of this lecture and I will begin by quoting uh, Chris Barker. Barker uh, Barker's text cultural uh, studies theory and practice you recall is a text which I said uh, may be uh, may well be uh, you know um, a textbook uh, in any any cultural studies course and uh, along with make his making sense of cultural studies. Um, though I talk about uh, several other books, uh, many other authors and their articles, okay? uh, if you uh, want to uh, really you know, be guided in, in theory of cultural studies, this is one person to look at. Now, let us see what Barker says. Barker says, today the notion of ideology at best implies the binding and justifying ideas of all social groups. There are these two terms actually, if I look at these two terms binding and justifying. Okay. Why binding? Binding because the, the, uh, um, the set of ideas or if you say the ruling ideas to use Marx's term, the ruling ideas of a society um, are the ideas which the dominant group would want people to accept to give them a, a certain sense of being um, uh, bound in, in, in a you know in a sense of being bound or in the sense of being related 
right, to one another. Um, could be here binding would mean to, to help people forge a collective identity as a community. Okay, that this is what we are, this is the way we should, should look at uh, the world, this is the way our society runs and as every dominant group would want people to believe, this is the optimal way in which we are bound together as members of a community. Right? And the second word justifying, look at these words, the binding and justifying ideas of all social groups. These, they, one in order to have to, if you want, if you if you are expected to incorporate that particular ideology or set of uh, you know ideologies. For instance, I let me give you an example. Um, within uh, say a, uh, a religious setup, uh, you know you have a world view in the sense that if you are you know uh, maybe a Hindu, if you are a practicing Hindu, uh, it is a different thing to be born into a Hindu family and a different thing to be a practicing Hindu. Many people who are born into a religious setup may end up being atheists. That is why I am saying if you are a practicing Hindu, then uh, the dominant view of your religion would want you to have a certain world view. A world view here means not simply a view of what the world is, what it is made up about. It also includes your place in it. Okay? So, for instance, you may believe that you are um, you are here on uh, you know in this world to work out your personal karmas, to you know to redress some of the things that were, were done in your previous life, so that you you know sort of graduate into uh, a better life in your next life. Okay, that is an ideology, that is a world view, right? And that has to be justified. Hmm. That has to be justified, that there has to be you know enough persuasion, so that you are not, you do not not only feel justified, you also feel related to similar practitioners. Do you follow? In the same way, for instance, let, let us uh, uh, let us look at uh, um, capitalism as an as a political ideology, right. And we talked about Hinduism as a religious ideology and capitalism as a political ideology uh, would the, the, uh, that ideology would want the subjects to believe uh, that uh, individualism is one that characterizes human beings more than cooperation. On the other hand, the world view within uh, a communist setup would be not competition, but cooperation. You see how given different ideologies, you have different world views. And as Barker says here, what is important that you ha should have a feeling of being bound, so to speak, related, so to speak, to your, uh, the people in your community, in your group, sharing, okay, sharing an ideology, sharing a world view, which is justified, which seems uh, to be the best thing possible. Okay. Now, uh, having talked uh, just a bit about, about uh, Karl Marx, there, you know, uh, I spoke spoke uh, at length in the two lectures on Marxism. So, I am not bringing in uh, Marxism again in a big way, but we can look at um, uh, uh, look at uh, the French uh, philosopher Louis Althusser. Okay? Louis Althusser here is important because we will take, will take us to you know more, more theorizations of ideology. Uh, Althusser says this, now look at this. One, there is no practice except by and in an ideology. Look at this, there is no practice except by okay, and in by and in an ideology. What does it mean? What is the practice being talked about here? Okay? The practice here is the practice we call cultural practice. Okay? Cultural practice here means the myriad ways in which you know, in which we practice life as it were, okay, in which we live out our lives, right. So, he says here that there cannot be any cultural practice, there cannot be any living out of our lives, okay, in what is what Hall called the grounded terrain of our material practices, of our beliefs, etcetera, okay, but only through ideology. That is, we live, this practice is by an ideology, okay by an ideology here means both constituted and constructed by an ideology and by also in the sense of 
following an ideology okay, by both constituted and by as in following something okay, by and in an ideology. So, you do not really see ideology, ideology is not something that you can go and catch and go and feel and touch, okay, but in an ideology is that space right, is that mental, intellectual, um, uh, emotional you know space remember where identities are created, where subjectivities are created. Now, you understand why we had to talk about identity and subjectivity uh, before we talked about ideology and how it ties into this uh, uh, to this lecture that there is we, we, we work all these are we work out our cultural lives in the arena so to speak okay, in the arena of ideology right. Second look at the next point here. He says there is no ideology except by the subject and for subjects. Okay. I am reading it again there is no ideology except by the subject and for subjects in the sense that there uh, a there cannot be any cultural practice without an ideology and b in this second point is that where is the question of having an ideology if there is no the, uh, no nobody to construct it in the first place and there is nobody for which it is constructed okay now this points to a very important uh, uh, important factor is that it is the subject the one that experiences okay remember our points on subjectivity it is the one that experiences okay it is the subject that creates it is it, it is it is by the subject it is created by the subject and also for subjects okay that is for is for people so what do we learn from these two postulations here a is that there can be no working out of our cultural lives or everyday lives of everything that has to do with culture remember the webs of significance and meaning making uh, it is possible only okay in an arena in a mental space so to speak okay of course given uh, given rise to by by matter okay by material lives uh, called ideology and second there is no ideology that has not been uh, you know by the subject and created for the subject right so looking at it uh, you know in the in the in diagrammatically we can therefore see that cultural practices ideology and the subject are all intertwined right ideology is something is the arena okay where we have the subject as call it an agent the subject is a creator at the same time the subject is a performer okay and the subject is the one that carries out the cultural practices and the cultural practices in turn are largely dependent on the ideology right so this is you know a schematic way of showing the same thing that was said by althusser just a while ago okay fine now let's look at another um, another uh, uh, postulation by althusser he says you and i are always already now this is a beautiful way of putting it always already that is you are now we'll I'll talk about this just a while let me read this you and i are always already subjects and as such constantly practice the rituals of ideological recognition which guarantee for us that we are indeed concrete individual distinguishable and naturally irreplaceable subjects okay now in the first case get this you and i are always already subjects always already here always already uh, means a certain givenness okay there is a certain givenness okay we are always already subjects that is our subjectivity our subjecthood our experience okay or what we are going to experience as we enter the social arena as we are socialized is already demarcated for us okay 
we should not think that this is a certain passivity that he is talking about. Okay, we sort of enter an arena that is uh, that has already been laid out to us by tradition, uh, you know, by the practices that are continuing. Okay, we don't uh, enter into something that has been sort of tailor made for us or that we immediately plunge into and uh, and uh, you know start creating for ourselves. Look at this. You and I are always already subjects. Okay, and as such, we constantly practice the rituals of ideological recognition. Okay, look at the term rituals. We perform. Just a while ago, I had said that we are. You know, we saw that schematic. Um, you know, that the diagram that we are not just creators. Okay, remember, by subjects and for subjects, we are also performers. Okay, we learn to imbibe. We learn to imbibe the rituals say of ideological recognition. A beautiful phrase rituals of ideological recognition. What does it mean? That the whole process of you know recognizing every part of the ideology is ritualized. Just like say uh, all of us go through certain rites uh, r i t e s rites of growing up what we call rites of passage. These rites of passage are you, you know say unique or individualized as far as all of us are concerned each of us is concerned, but these are also rituals that we recognize others recognize even as we pass through these rituals. Okay. So, this is th this is a really uh, a sophisticated way of talking about ideology. Now, I um, uh, I would uh, like to quote from uh, you know Douglas M. Kellner and uh, Minakshi Durham uh, from their uh, you know uh, reader on very 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 important reader on uh, culture studies on media studies. Okay, uh, they 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 show the uh, the connection uh, here with with Karl Marx. Okay, beginning with Marx's thesis that the mode of production determines the character of social, intellectual and cultural life, Althusser sees ideology as an effect of the structure of society. Okay. Remember, we began with Marx and this is how Kellner and Durham are, are joining Marx and Althusser and, and sees how Althusser goes on to improvise what Marx has said that Marx's thesis okay, that the base the mode of production determines the superstructure or the ideology of or the character the nature of the social cultural life. What Althusser does here is he sees ideology as an effect of the structure of society. Okay. So, ideology here is uh, the effect of how society is structured and it is look at this word first is it is an effect then it is a force in which economic, political, legal, cultural and ideological practices are interrelated to shape social consciousness. Okay. So, what is then Althusser's, uh, uh, Althusser's contribution here is he sees ideology as a an effect of the structure of our society and b it is a force in which the practices are interrelated and we, which go on to you know again as if coming full circle go on to uh, shape social consciousness. So, this is known as look at this term here structural Marxism. Okay. Althusser in this sense is, uh, is a structuralist he, he sees uh, uh, all these aspects of Marxism in structuralist sense, in the sense of systems, in the sense of cultures or oh sorry of structures. So, in Althusser's version of structural Marxism, ideological state apparatus and this is a very important point. One of the reasons why I brought Althusser here or we have to bring Althusser here in the first place is talking about the apparatuses and I will describe them uh, just in a while. Okay. Uh, I will just read it and then we will go on to talk about it again. Uh, unpack it. In Althusser's version of structural Marxism, ideological state apparatuses like schooling, media, the judiciary, etcetera, interpolated individuals into preconceived forms of subjectivity that left no space for opposition or resistance. This is uh, this is Kellner and Durham 
offering uh, both a description uh, and perhaps a critique okay, of Althusser's reworking of Marxism, okay, of Marx's idea of etiology. Okay. They call it or, or uh, they may not be, have been the first to call it, but it is usually said that Althusser is a structuralist Marxist and um, there is this very important word called interpolation, which I will talk about just in a while that uh, the ideological forms they interpolate or call upon people okay, into look at this word preconceived forms of subjectivity that left no space for opposition uh, or of uh, opposition or resistance. Uh, many critics of Althusser, okay, in fact many critics of anyone who has come after Marx uh, and have tried those who have tried to you know improvise and, uh, on Marx and you know uh, 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 give additions or contributions or reinterpretations uh, interpretations of Marx, all of them have come into critique. Uh, it may seem in a structuralist that you know when, when, when Althusser gives us a structuralist explanation, it may seem and it has seemed to many critics that it takes away, uh, takes away the revolutionary element that is there in classical Marxism. Okay. For instance, when we say that you know the ideological forms like schooling, okay, the education system, uh, the media, the judiciary, etc., that they call upon individuals, okay, and uh, they put them into certain already existing, okay, forms of subjectivity. Now you will perhaps understand in a better way the use of Althusser's term always already. If you remember just a while ago we had spoken about always already that there is, it, there is a givenness to subjectivity. This as I said many feel takes away the revolutionary element of the agents, I mean the agency of human beings okay? because you are or Althusser is looking at us as being always called upon by ideological systems to fit into preconceived, uh, uh, preconceived forms of subjectivity. That is said here, look at this slide please, that left no space for opposition or resistance. Right? Now, we will talk about uh, what these apparatuses are. Okay. First is the ideology and ideological state apparatuses. Okay. There are two types of apparatuses that were brought to our attention by Althusser and they are one ideological state apparatuses or ISA and number two they are the repressive state apparatuses or the RSAs. So, the ISAs and RSAs as, as, as we you know, talk about them in short form are the two kinds of apparatuses that are used by society to make us as he says always already subjects of a given ideological configuration. Now, I am quoting from uh, Althusser himself please look at this slide. I shall call ideological state apparatuses a certain number of realities which present themselves to the immediate observer in the form of distinct and specialized institutions. Okay. These distinct and specialized institutions are not institutions that use force. Okay. That is, there are, there are a plural, plurality of ideological state apparatuses. That is, State here is what? The state is obviously here we know is not you know the state of Assam or Manipur or Andhra Pradesh, the state here is the government. Okay? So, every government which is what Marx would call the ruling class, okay, every, uh, every government uh, has um, of course, the roughly uh, what Marx would call the, the ruling class, uh, every government has certain forms and what Althusser calls a plurality of forms. Okay, through which ideology is, is uh, tried to be disseminated. Remember produce and distributed and consumed okay, ideology is sought to be distributed. So, he says that there are many such ideological state apparatuses. Look at the look at the word resonance of the word apparatus. He is not using uh, words like branches or forms or anything, he is using apparatuses. You know this really brings uh, you know to us the instrumentalization 
you know the apparatus is something you would use in a laboratory for instance. Okay. Apparatus brings to us the resonance of the of words of something like instrumentalization. Now, instrumentalization of our lives by the state in its different forms is something which again ties in very neatly to what Althusser calls our always already you know ready for use subjectivities. Okay. Now, Unpacking this, the ideological state. Now, what are these ideological state apparatuses? What are these ideological state instruments? One, the religious ideological state apparatus. The religious, I say, are, for instance, in a Christian country, the system of the different churches. Okay, so the church, the religion, religion is also seen as an ideological form, and the various religious institutions are the apparatuses or the instru instruments through which okay, certain ideologies are sought to be distributed um, in, in, uh, in society as desirable, okay, as desirable ideologies. Then education, education according to Althusser, I mean, we know education is a part of the superstructure uh, in the Marxist schema. Uh, education is the system of the different public and private schools that we have. Okay. The educational system decides what is going to be taught. Now, that too may be seen as an apparatus because of the very instrumentality okay, that is there. It, it tells us what to read, it decides beforehand what is to be disseminated in the name of and that is why there is a certain instrumentalization in, the, in this ideological form called education. The family. Okay. Today, we can safely say, uh, you know, even uh, looking back at history and looking even to our, you know, to our um, um, societies, okay, that the family is the perhaps the oldest social institution, but see how the family has changed, okay. When we look at, um, look at mythologies, when we look at certain tales, for instance, in a certain epoch, it would not raise anyone's eyebrows to to say that a king had 300 wives okay, or that the king had so many concubines and there would be uh, you know the chief queen etcetera. Okay. So, that would be some sort of an extended family. right? Today, we have different kinds of families. We have uh, you know the joint family that still survives and, uh, and there are then the you know the nuclear family with just the father, the mother and uh, you know the children. There is a family where there are adopted children, there are even gay families or homosexual families where you know the two members are of the same sex and they adopt children okay, or they have ch you know they have a family. So, we see that you know but, but uh, even though there is there is a sort of tolerance of all forms of families. Uh, it is it would not be wrong to say that in you know in, in, in given in any given setup where there is ideology, okay, there is also the ideology of what is the ideal family. Okay. The ideal family today is certainly not the family of uh, or a situation in or it is not supposed to be, I would not say no, in there are many tribes. Uh, um, still, uh, you know, there are many uh, communities in which you will find that uh, it is not unnatural at all. It is not, uh, uh, you know, it's something, it's not something uh, uh, out of the ordinary for a household to have one man with his three or four wives and their extended children. Okay, it is after all a form of the family. Okay, but there is always the, you know, the ideology which says that that kind of family is not. Uh, you know the ideal kind of family. It is the individual family with the nuclear family with the mother and the father and the two children okay, which, are, which is supposed to be the best family. Now, why how do we call it the best, fam best form of family? Okay? How do we measure it? There is no natural way of measuring it. There are different kinds of families. Okay? How, do, how can you say that the homosexual or the gay family is something that um, that is a wrong sort of family. No, this ties into the kind of government and the tolerance that that the government and also you know the in you know in an intolerant situation the instrumentalization of what a family should be like. Okay. So, the sort of you know the, the normalization 
the normalization of what family should be, the normalization that is normalization in the sense of following norms of what uh, religion should be or religious experience should be, what uh, the education what, or the best kind of school should be is not something that is natural, it is created that is most important. It is created and it is upheld to be the best kind that, uh, that mankind has sort of evolved, okay, evolved to. Uh, to have. Then the others are if you look at the slide the legal system, okay, it's same the same thing follows for the legal system. What was legal uh, to what is legal today it was not legal a couple of years ago, okay, it was not legal a century ago, okay, or what is illegal today will uh, in many cases not be not be legal a couple of years later. Okay, it is important to realize that the legal system, the laws are created and law, the legal system is a very important part of what Althusser calls the ideological state apparatuses. Okay. Perhaps the instrumentality of the legal and the judicial system, the intru instrumentality, instru instrumentalization of our lives is, is um, at its peak when we talk about these two forms of ideological state apparatuses or ISA that is the judicial form and the legal forms. Okay. These uh, actually carry out the instrumentalization of our lives. Then the trade union, the communications that is the press, radio, television etcetera. Then the cultural systems like literature, arts, sports all these are if we unpack the term uh, ideological state apparatuses all these are forms. Now, if you just simply look at the list it is amazing you know how this always already that you know so Althusser says so beautifully is created for us, but we have to understand we have to have to remind ourselves that um, this list okay, is something that is not a given and what the earlier Marxists uh, you know or, or rather the classical view of Marxism says that the revolutionary element uh, should be there it is not just that we simply understand the ways in which life is instrumentalized by the ideological state apparatuses. We one has to go forward in order to contest those that the processes of normalization that are there. Next is the other uh, aspect of, uh, of uh, ap, uh, you know of ideology which is what he says he calls also calls the repressive state apparatuses. Obviously, by the, the moment we use a word like repressive, you will understand that there is a certain amount of violence. Okay. Uh, by here violence, I do not mean only uh, physical violence, only coercion, violence also means uh, coercion, uh, coercion of our, of our mental forms, coercion of our thoughts for instance, okay, the violence of our thoughts. Now, let us look at this quickly, repressive state apparatuses, if you look at this slide. The repressive state apparatus or uh, RSA, uh, uh, Althusser quotes here, functions by violence, whereas the ideological state apparatuses function by ideology. What are the repressive state apparatuses? The repressive state apparatuses may be the state instruments that are used to repress okay, life, repress um, our social life, and these are. Uh, these are the um, uh, these are the police, uh, the armed forces. Okay, where uh, and there may be situations like uh, what we had in India in the the emergency. Okay, certain situations in which there is it's not just there is there is uh, only violence, only open violence or violent uh, repression. Okay, there is also the curtailing of so many of our rights. Okay, so the the uh, the, the situations like the emergency may, may not happen all the time, but certainly the very presence of the police, the very presence of the armed forces okay, are a sign that the repressive state apparatuses are always present. Okay. Uh, they are there so, so to speak uh, to be used by the state hmm, 
to enforce the ideologies. Okay. So, we look at this again the RSA or the repressive state apparatus functions by violence as uh, Althusser says, whereas the ideological state apparatuses like uh, the media, the education, family etcetera function by ideology or values or sets of values and meanings. This is an important distinction uh, we need to note. Okay. Now, I will read further and uh, explain uh, uh, a couple of more things. I am quoting again, every state apparatus whether repressive or ideological functions both by violence and by ideology, but with one very important distinction which makes it imperative not to confuse the ideological state apparatus with the repressive state apparatus. This is the fact that the repressive state apparatus functions massively and predominantly by repression including physical repression while functioning secondarily by ideology. There is no such thing as a purely repressive apparatus, this is important. Okay. Uh, even, even as we make the distinction between uh, uh, repressive and ideological state apparatuses and we say uh, that um, the repressive state apparatuses are purely, uh, purely you know uh, they are purely related to force and even violence and that the ideological you know state apparatuses are purely or uh, uh, purely ideological have to do with meanings. No, there is a certain a certain uh, uh, sophistication to it, there is a certain interchangeability to it, there are aspects of one in the other. How? Okay. Let us look at this again. The ideological uh, um, you know the ideological state apparatus, it does not mean that the ideological state apparatuses are not violent. Okay. Many uh, today even say that there is even nothing called ideological state apparatuses. Many say that all apparatuses are repressive, okay. all apparatuses are violent by degree, all apparatuses, all ideologies are coercive. Okay. You will uh, 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 we, we can refer to um, Antonio Gramsci uh, idea of hegemony, I will talk about this in a while, but again look at this what uh, is said here. Let us uh, let's go through this again. Every state apparatus, whether repressive or ideological, functions both by violence and by ideology. That is, whether it is the ideological state apparatus or the repressive state apparatus. The point, the important point to be noted is uh, uh, you know, violence and ideology inform both. And as I said, uh, many would, many today say that there is nothing called rep ideological state apparatus. There is all kinds of apparatus, state apparatus are repressive. Okay. Uh, I am reading again, this is the fact that the repressive state apparatus functions massively and predominantly by repression while functioning secondarily by ideology. Primarily RSAs may function by, repre by repressive measures, by violent measures, but they are these, these apparatuses are also they are informed by an ideology. For instance, it says here in brackets, there is no such thing as a purely repressive apparatus. A purely repressive apparatus would have to be a mindless one if it is not informed by ideology. Then for example, the army and the police also function by ideology both to ensure their own cohesion and reproduction and the values they propound externally. If you did not believe in in uh, why you are perpetrating violence, okay, then if there is not an indoctrination to a certain extent. Okay. When you need see when you need to kill an enemy in war, you have to believe at least to a certain degree that it is worth your while to kill and kill your enemy. Okay. You have to be indoctrinated beforehand um, that the enemy is something to be done away with. Okay, for the sake of your country. So, you can't say that in the same way even within a nation, okay, when you use the armed uh, when the use the armed forces against uh, a so called uh, you know uh, group that is a violent group, okay, then you have to in a way be informed by an ideology that that violent group is not good for the country. Okay. So, violence itself includes ideology and this is I think uh, a good sophistication of what Althusser um, has said so far. Then again look at this slide in the same way, but inversely 
Okay, this in the, in the inverse way this applies. It is essential to say that for their part the ideological state apparatuses function massively and dominantly by ideology, but they also function secondarily by repression. The inverse is true in the case of the ISAs. Even if ultimately, but only ultimately, this is very attenuated and concealed, even symbolic. Okay, the repression that is there in ideological state apparatuses. Remember, I said that people. Uh, there are many critics who today would would uh, uh, like to tell us that uh, there is so much violence. Okay, in ideological state apparatuses, uh, so much violence in the education system, in the legal system, in the judicial system, in the family. In fact, okay, that you can't call it an ideological state apparatus, uh, at least in a simplistic way. Therefore, again reading, thus schools and churches use suitable methods of punishment, expulsion, selection. Okay? Look at these, these institutions, these superstructural institutions, they too use violence, they punish, uh, they, they rusticate, they expel, okay? they use uh, systems of selections, of gradations to discipline not only their shepherds, but also their flocks. The same is true also of the family. Okay? These may raise some uncomfortable uh, you know uh, feelings in us um, in the sense that we we idolize the family we idolize uh, and idealize the religious systems but we have to take note of what uh, ideological studies tells us or what cultural studies tells us and in this case what Althusser uh, and uh, tells us and our understanding of Althusser's ISAs and RSAs tell us is that things are not so simple Right? You have to sort of remove the veneer, the veil of you know of uh, these so called ideal systems, if you are to understand these in a cultural studies sort of way. In that sense cultural studies may be sometimes uh, a little uh, a little painful, okay? but I would say as somebody who has been teaching cultural studies has been talking about ideology about all these forms that uh, 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 painful as they may be, these are also ways of growing up. Uh, I uh, would now move on, uh, we are coming to the close of this lecture and we look at the word, remember we, there is a word interpolation which we have not talked about, uh, you know which we said is to call out. Okay, the word interpolation which many say, say that uh, has sort of reduced the revolutionary element in Althusser's instructional Marxism. Okay. Now, look at the word uh, interpolation and this is from Lenin and philosophy and other essays. I okay. will read it out, ideology represents the imaginary relationship of individuals to their real conditions of existence. Ideology also has a material existence. Now, the third point is most important, third and fourth points is all ideology hails, the important word here is hails. Okay, you can, uh, if you want a simpler word for interpolation, the word is hails, that is interpolation is calling out to somebody, hailing somebody, when you greet somebody or you call out to somebody who is far away, okay, you hail, you beckon that person. Ideology is also to be seen according to Althusser in those terms. All ideology, okay, their forms, uh, and their, the beliefs, everything, they all ideology hails or interpolates concrete individuals as concrete subjects, calls out. Remember, just a few slides ago, we had seen that there are certain preconceived slots into which in the ideology tells us. For instance, the ideology, uh, the dominant ideology of a mother. Okay, the cultural role uh, women, uh, uh, some women play as mothers, that is also calling out by ideology. Say the best way to be a mother is this, like saying hello or calling out to somebody, look this is how you should be as a mother and all the other stories of sacrificing for your children and all the things that follow from here are nothing but ideology hailing or calling out to you to perform given that a historical situation of what true motherhood is or for instance what true nationhood is, how to be a good citizen for instance, uh, ideology, the ideology of good citizenry or citizenship is something that calls out to you, beckons you and tells you look this is the best way to be a mother or this is the best way to be, uh, uh, to be a citizen. Now the important point to be realized here is this 
is what the last point here. Individuals are always already subjects. The moment you enter into the cultural arena, what happens is you are already constituted. Your roles as in this case mother or the role of a citizen is always already ready for you. You just have to enter that slot. Okay? So, again uh, uh, Althusser on interpolation, all ideology hails or interpolates concrete individuals as concrete subjects. I shall then suggest that ideology acts or functions in such a way that it look at the word recruits. Okay? So, look at apparatus, instrumentalization, recruits, right? recruits subjects among the individuals or transforms the individuals into subjects by that very precise operation which I have called this is Althusser which I have called interpolation or hailing and which can be imagined along the lines of the most commonplace everyday uh, uh, everyday sorry it should be polite everyday polite or other hailing hey you there okay it seems to be as simple as hey you there somebody calling you and this is not overtly by violence most of the time that, that this is done. It is another matter that there is a, a certain degree of violence done on you the moment you are being the word used here transformed, the moment you are being recruited. Okay? That is another matter, but it may seem to be as simple as something like saying somebody calling out hey you there okay? and just look at the intimacy of what is uh, of the of this phrase here. Then uh, a quick look at Gramsci's concept of ideology. We do not have much time here, but we need to look at this. Its original meaning was that of the science of ideas and since analysis was the only method recognized and applied by science, it means analysis of ideas that is investigation of the origin of ideas. This was the concept of ideology understood simply as the, the, the science of ideas. Okay? Ideology itself must be analyzed historically in terms of the philosophy of praxis as a superstructure. And one must therefore, distinguish between historically organic ideologies, those that is which are necessary to a given structure and ideologies that are arbitrarily rationalistic or will. We can skip this uh, for the moment and uh, move on to what Barker has to say about uh, uh, Gramsci and this is what he says. For Gramsci, ideology is grasped as ideas, meanings and practices. while which while they purport to be universal truths are maps of meaning that support the power of particular social classes. This is obviously um, uh, same, the same as what is mentioned in classical Marxism okay? that ideology are, are maps of meaning that support the power of particular social classes. And uh, uh, the final uh, paragraph ideology is understood to be both lived experience and a body of systematic ideas whose role is to organize and bind together a block of diverse social elements to act as social cement okay, in the formation of hegemonic and counter hegemonic blocks. So, there is a certain cementing of people together as a coherent whole and which is known as hegemony which Barker, sorry which um, Gramsci called uh, a call consent that is manufactured without much overt violence. So, we move on uh, quickly and end with, uh, end with uh, the, the at least those the questions relating to what we have been able to discuss so far. So, now if, uh, if you ask the question what are the various ideological state apparatuses. Now, the moment you say ideological state apparatuses, obviously Althusser has to come to your mind and you have to define them in terms of Althusser's framework. So, this is how you would answer, you would uh, if it is a short answer you simply mention these, but if it is a long answer you have to weave these into these points all that we have discussed so far as you know so remember interpolation, uh, uh, instrumentalization. Uh, then the amount of uh, repression involved in ideology okay, all these uh, have to be uh, woven into the answers, but if it is a short answer then you simply mention the religious, educational, family, legal, trade union, communication systems and cultural forms that are that go into the making of it, uh, these ideological state apparatuses. How are the ideological state apparatuses and the RSS or the repressive state apparatuses usually differentiated then you need to look at it from this point of view. Simply speaking, if you look only at the difference, then the police, the armed forces, 
that form the repressive sto state apparatuses function by violence whereas, the ideological apparatuses function by ideology. After mentioning this if it is a long uh, it is a question with uh, 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 you know um, more marks then you may also say however, this is a simplistic way of looking at it and that you know in both cases uh, the you know uh, the other element is also present. For instance, in RSAs or repressive state apparatuses it is not a question of pure repression or pure violence because that has to be backed up by a belief. Okay. For instance, as I said you can give the example of killing an enemy in, uh, in a battlefield you have to believe that behind or there is an ideology behind this that the enemy is uh, you know to call enemy somebody that deserves to die has to be backed up by a certain set of ideas okay. and in the same way inversely in ideological state apparatuses there is also a certain violence that has been you know uh, that has been created. It may not be physical violence, but there is also the violence of categorizing things okay. the violence uh, that is caused by, uh, by uh, uh, leaving out other ways of thinking. Then explain the term interpolation. How would you explain the term interpolation? Uh, then you can look at what Althusser says that interpolation is a hailing or calling out okay? and that interpolation you can use other words once you hail out once you respond then you are recruited in the service of an ideology you are then transformed according to that ideology and that that interpolation may begin with a very, uh, a, a very familiar hey you out there. Okay? But once uh, that beckoning is responded to then it is uh, uh, not a very difficult step. The next step is not very difficult that is to sort of instru uh, in, you know, instrumentalize uh, ideologize that person into a certain set of beliefs. Then how does Gramsci understand ideology and we end with this. Uh, for Gramsci now this is through Barker ideology is grasped as ideas meanings and practices. Okay. Now, remember this look at this familiar term that we looked at a while ago maps of meaning that support the power of particular social classes. In this understanding of, of Gramsci we find both we find both uh, you know ideology as meanings maps of meanings and also ideology as the power of particular ruling classes. Okay. These two elements are there present. So, in this case despite what many may say. Uh, we cannot completely say that the revolutionary element is out uh, when it comes to Gramsci. So, here ideology is not separate from the practical activities of life, but provides people with rules of practical conduct. Okay, the normative ideology is normative and therein is the violence many would say. Okay, the moment you try and normalize things into a certain channel into a certain set of beliefs you have already committed a certain violence. Okay. So, rules of practical conduct of moral behavior rooted in our day to day conditions. Ideology is not something that uh, uh, it is there outside of our society. Ideology is in us, ideology in a way is us. Okay. So, important is ideology to the study of culture and, and that is why I have devoted two lectures to, uh, to this. In the first lecture what did we see? We saw that ideology we saw the different nuances of the term ideology. Um, uh, then we also looked very briefly at Marx's formulation that ruling uh, ideas of every age are the ideas of the ruling class. Okay. Then we looked at Althusser's differentiation between two types of ideological apparatuses. We also looked at uh, certain crossings between the two and how they you know they are inversely related one is present in the other. Then we looked at Gramsci when we find both understanding of ideology as maps of meaning and as, and as power are related together. Also importantly how ideology according to Gramsci is present. Uh, as hegemony okay, throughout our lives and uh, our day to day lives are informed by ideology. And then finally, let me just read out this last uh, part of the slide to you. Please have a look at the slide. Ideology is understood to be both lived experience, it is both lived experience and the body of systematic ideas. You cannot separate them both. Okay. It is both lived experience and the body of systematic ideas and what is the role of ideology? The role of ideology is to organize and bind together a block of diverse social elements okay. to give us feeling or feeling at least a feeling that we are all related in a coherent whole, we are all following the same beliefs, the same ideas, we are all one. So, everything 
in, a, in, in an end is an ideology. Patriotism is an ideology, nationalism is an ideology, everything is an ideology. The family itself is an ideology, the educational system which uh, you know we think is the optimum in our time is also an ideology, a way of looking at the world is a set of ideas, okay. it is it sometimes goes on to become a doctrine and most importantly in cultural studies particularly it is maps of meaning okay, or the pointers to meaning making and to see uh, uh, how we you know may create meanings and values in our lives. So, I hope this um, you know these two lectures on ideology there is indeed a lot more that can be said many theories that, but at least as a beginning for you to feel uh, feel uh, uh, you know necessary uh, to even want to desire to go into further studies of ideology. I hope uh, these two lectures have sufficed. The next lecture we are going to deal with yet another important uh, the crucial very central topic a key concept and that is that of representation. Thank you for now.